Hello, and welcome to The Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US, a podcast in which we explore the mind-bending world of global supply chain, covering topics such as automation, innovation, unique identity, and more. I'm your co-host, Reed. And I'm Liz. And welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. Are you ready to talk food safety? Or are you interested in the Food Safety Modernization Act? Or do you just have some questions about food in general? Well, today... That's what we're going to be talking about. Now, Liz and I won't be hosting today's podcast. We have a special edition episode. GS1 US CEO Bob Carpenter will be interviewing Frank Giannis. Now, Frank just spent the last four years with the FDA as the Deputy Commissioner of Food and Policy. He's also one of the architects for the Food Safety Modernization Act. Frank does have a lot of experience when it comes to food and safety. He spent 10 years at Walmart as the vice president of food safety and 19 years at Disney, where he was the director of safety and health. So without any further ado, let's join Bob and Frank in their conversation. Thanks, Reed, and uh, welcome. As Reed mentioned, my name is Bob Carpenter. I'm president and CEO of GS1 US. And today we're joined by former Deputy Commissioner of FDA, Frank Giannis, to discuss a bit about the Section 204 of the Food Safety Modernization Act, which is now known as the Food Traceability Final Rule. And I'd like to turn it over to Frank just to introduce himself because he brings a unique set of skills and capabilities to the work that he does today. So Frank, perhaps you could introduce yourself. Thanks, Bob. I'm excited to spend some time talking about the future of a safer and smarter food system. But yeah, by way of background, real briefly, I like to say I started my career working at the happiest place on earth, the Disney company. I was there for about 20 years overseeing food safety, as well as other safety matters for theme parks and resorts. After 20 years, I went from the happiest place on earth to what I describe as the busiest place on earth. I joined the Walmart company, uh, world's largest retailer and joined because food is really important to me and it allowed me to have a lot of depth and breadth on food. Walmart being pretty big on food, one average of $4 spent on food in the U.S. is actually spent at a Walmart store. So privilege and honored to have served at Walmart for a decade. And then in 2018, I decided to join federal service. I went from the private sector to the public sector, went to FDA, and for the past four and a half years, was privileged and fortunate to serve the American people and regulated industries as deputy commissioner for food policy and response at the FDA under two administrations and during a global pandemic. But what an honor and privilege. So I went from the happiest place on earth to the busiest place on earth. Then Bob, I like to say to one of the most important regulatory agencies on earth. Frank, what always struck me in our relationship is the incredible insight that you bring from both your time in the public and the private sector. And you know, that concept of shared value, how can we work on common problems for mankind, for food safety, there were public and private partnership need to come together, I think is so important. And so I wanted to start with that. As you look back on all the great work that you did at the FDA, Do you feel that we've really sufficiently leveraged both the private and the public sector to really implement things like industry standards or available technologies to implement the food traceability rule? Yeah, thanks for that. It's a great question and one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about because I have been fortunate to be on both sides of that fence. The quick answer is no. But first, let me just say, you know, I'm really honored and so proud of the work that we did at FDA, especially during the past four and a half years. We had to address a global pandemic. I think all of your listeners will know that the virus that caused COVID-19 wasn't transmitted via food, but nevertheless, it did wreak and test the U.S. food system. So very proud of the work we did there. We advanced the Food Safety Modernization Act. And so for your listeners, this was the most sweeping reform to our nation's food laws in over 100 years. And uh, over the past four and a half years, despite tough times, we move FISMA rules forward, whether it was ag water, advancing agricultural water standards, which are so important for produce safety. And we did finalize something that we're going to spend a little time talking about, the food traceability rule. We launched something called a new era of smarter food safety, Bob, the idea that we need to look at the world around us and how it's changing and leverage new and emerging technologies. But to answer your question, no, I mean, almost in every single thing that I've mentioned there, had we been further along in what I call both public-private collaboration, leveraging existing consensus standards such as GS1, and new and emerging technologies on everything, and I mean sincerely everything that I've mentioned, I think it would have been a lot easier. 
So uh, the answer is no. And hopefully in today's discussion, I can give some examples on where could have we made a difference had we been doing these two things a little bit differently or better. That's helpful. And, and I'd love to double click, if you will, on the comment that you just made, Frank, around thinking about technology and existing standardized data. What more could we be doing to enhance supply chain accountability, food safety, public health? And are there specifically technologies for which you're particularly excited on the horizon? Yeah. So let me tackle both of those questions. One is what else can we be doing and how could better data sharing, leveraging these consensus standards and emerging technologies, how can that allow us to have a safer and smarter food system? And two, what are some of the emerging technologies? Because I'm really excited about that, the emerging technologies. But let me just provide your listeners a little bit of background. I mean, I think they're going to know as well as I do, or maybe even better than I, that these have been challenging times for our nation and for the global food system. The past few years are unprecedented. For folks like myself that have been doing this for 20, 30 years, they've been very challenging times. You know, the sheer size and scope of the food system is daunting. You think it's a very large, distributed, decentralized food system. On top of that, you've seen the headwinds we've experienced. We continue to have snarled supply chains to this day. We're not past that. There are labor challenges, obviously. If you talk to food manufacturers and farmers, we've seen what's happening with fuel prices. We've seen, for example, how conflicts in certain parts of the world can affect food. And we're increasingly concerned about climate change. So I say there are a lot of pressures and headwinds. But ultimately, I believe that many of us believe that these headwinds will present challenges, but opportunities. And here's where the opportunities come in with data standards and new and emerging technologies. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. At the height of the pandemic, Bob, we were asking ourselves in federal services, what does the virus mean to food? And we knew it wasn't going to be transmitted by food, but we knew it would wreak havoc on the supply chain. And that's because this basic idea, once you start seeing the virus go from cities like we initially saw from Seattle and New York to rural America, where food is produced, we knew it would start affecting food workers' health. And we knew once you start disrupting workforces by 5 or 10%, you're going to have problems with production. And so we immediately had to say, well, what can we do? What can we do to ensure that the American people continue to have access to safe and available food during a crisis? And if you remember at the height of the pandemic, it wasn't that we didn't have enough food. We had food in the wrong places. And right then we saw the idea that if we had better standards and if we had better technology, we could enable being flexible and nimble to get food to the right places. But we just did that. So for example, at the FDA, the way we identified most of the food facilities that we regulate is by assigning a unique FDA identification code. But that code meant nothing to our partners or the private sector in the supply chain. So that's an example. If we were working on harmonized data standards, it would have been identification of facilities. And it would certainly make that easier. And then we didn't have technologies. And so we had to literally engage with a large technology provider to create a platform that we called 21 Ford so that we could identify where the facilities were in geospatial form. We could overlay that with COVID transmission, use predictive capabilities to see where COVID was going in those local communities, and then try to harden those assets. But Bob, we were playing catch up. We were playing 100% catch up because we hadn't invested in leveraging consensus standards and leveraging technologies for the way we did our work. So that's one example. Another one is seafood, I like to say. About 94% of all seafood consumed by Americans comes from abroad. It's not coming off of our domestic waters. And ensuring the safety of those imported products, not knowing where they came from, was pretty tough. And so one of the projects and pilots that we did during my tenure, Bob, is we tried to better identify the facilities that are making these products. Again, we weren't leveraging consensus standards, such as the GS1, GLNs, or G10s. And so to clean up the data of who was importing seafood into the United States, that was a large exercise. We had a lot of data, but it wasn't structured, it wasn't cleaned up. But then we started looking at it the historical food shipments of seafood into the United States using a new and emerging technology called AI. And we were able to demonstrate that we could increase our predictive capabilities of finding volatile seafood shipments by 300%. You heard that right, a whopping 300%. So those are two examples, Bob, real quickly, that no, we're not leveraging, I think, technology sufficiently enough, and we're not utilizing harmonized standards or consensus standards to agree. And when you do so, the benefits are profound to the U.S. food system. In terms of new and emerging technologies, I'll try to be brief and succinct, but there are so many. I mean, for something that's near and dear to both of us, it's just product identification. And I hope we get into the food traceability rule. But I'm pretty excited about all the new and emerging technology, whether it's RFID, 
something that my prior employer was interested in years ago, but I think it's an idea whose time has come. I'm seeing the emergence of many other type of sensor type devices, whether it's IoT pixels, very flexible sensor technology that is bringing the cost down. And so we can move to an era of not only tracking and tracing, but monitoring assets such as food. Some of these technologies that we've just talked about, big data technologies such as AI and others, give me so much hope, Bob, because we're bridging that divide between a lot of data that the FDA has but is not utilizing and turning it into powerful predictive information. And then some that might not be as relevant today's conversation, but the whole revolution that's happening in genomics and how that's advancing what we know about food and the safety of foods and many others. So there's more we can do, certainly. Frank, thank you for that answer. And and those are two wonderful examples around technology. I'd like to switch gears a bit and talk about the food traceability rule because you are really the primary architect. And I know how passionate you are about food safety, given your 29 years in industry. Perhaps you could share with us a little bit why you put such a high priority on the food traceability rule and coming into the public sector to work on that. That's a great question. I really appreciate it because you're right. We've known each other for a while now, and I've leveraged and leaned on GS1 to try to accomplish better food traceability. But why? Yeah, it's been important to me both in my tenure in the private sector, when I was at Walmart, we led a traceability initiative, first retailer to require traceability for fresh leafy greens, leveraging distributed ledger technology. And people will remember my story of the life cycle of a mango and how we used blockchain technology to trace that back to source in 2.2 seconds as opposed to seven days. But yeah, I left a pretty great company, Walmart, and I went to federal service for a variety of reasons, but one of them was that FDA had a requirement to write a food traceability rule. They hadn't written it. They were sued by some consumer groups to finalize this rule. It was always part of FISMA, which was passed in 2011. And during my tenure, we got the rule done. And now we have the final food traceability upon us with the compliance date of January 2026. But you asked the right question, which is not What's in the rule? We'll get into that, but why? And the why informs what we do. Bob, real candidly, why? Because in almost every major food safety scare, food safety outbreak crisis that I've had to manage over the course of my career, food traceability has been an Achilles heel to being able to do that well. A lack of traceability and transparency in the food system, let me repeat it, I believe is an Achilles heel in the food system. It's pretty big and marvelous when you come to think about it. There are big brands that do a pretty good job of it. But food traceability is also their Achilles heel, and you've seen how it's brought that down. Let me give you just a couple of relevant examples. And I could give you dozens, but in 2006, some of your listeners will recall there was an outbreak of E. coli 157 in our nation. CDC and FDA at that time, I was in the private sector, told us we're seeing illnesses with E. coli 157H7, some of them severe, some of them among infants or kids. And they said, we know the association is with bag spinach because of epidemiological studies but we don't know the source of the bag spinach. And so health officials came out with the public health advisory and they said, U.S. consumers do not eat any bag spinach until we identify the source. If you remember like I do, we were pulling bag spinach off store shelves, whether they were grocery or food service restaurants, spinach just disappeared. Well, it took the industry almost six, seven, eight years to recover because there was so much loss in consumer confidence. But when FDA did that trace back, it took them two weeks to identify the source. And when they identified the source, Bob, it was one spinach producer, one day's production, one lot number. The damage that that does to consumer trust, wiping out the livelihoods of farmers, that's a lack of traceability. It's a cost to society. I'll just give you two more examples to make this why it's so important. If you fast forward to the year 2009, there was an outbreak with salmonella, large 700 plus cases, people were dying. And it was linked to a peanut paste produced by a company called PCA or Peanut Corporation of America. Now, PCA produced about 2 to 3% of the peanut paste in our country, but they sent it to so many different suppliers that in turn used that peanut paste. It wound up in over 3,000, I think maybe up to 4,000 SKUs, different stock keeping units that contained PCA peanut paste. Bob, I was working at the world's largest retailer at that time. I can remember recalls for PCA containing ingredients coming in three months after the outbreak had been identified. Three months. Because brands, some of these big brands could not identify where that product went and what was in it. And so that's the cost. And then the last one, you think, well, it's taken us a long time to learn the lessons. In 2018, I joined FDA in the fall, November, and what we were experiencing, 
almost spinach all over again, but this time with romaine lettuce. And at Thanksgiving holidays, the FDA and CDC telling the nation, don't eat romaine lettuce until we identify the source of it. That's the why. It's really important. Now, real quickly, Bob, I think it's worth pausing to mention to your listeners that sometimes people think traceability is for crisis management. And while I think those answers are well-intentioned, I can't tell you, I, I think they're really off the mark. Number one, better traceability in the event of a food scare allows you to identify the food faster and remove it off of the market quicker with precision. So one, you're going to prevent illnesses. It's a form of prevention. We call that secondary prevention. Number two is if you can pinpoint it like that, you don't destroy the livelihoods of farmers who are unaffected. You know, our nation's court system, we say you're innocent until proven guilty. In food safety scares, you're guilty until proven innocent. And so food traceability will clear your good name and allow us to find where the problem is really happening. Third is root cause analysis, Bob. In my profession, we see these outbreaks happen over and over again. So if we could trace back the source quickly, we can understand how these things happen and hopefully prevent them from happening in the future. That's a form of prevention. And then lastly, I think the big idea, which will resonate with your listeners, is the idea of creating greater transparency. And if you think about forces that are good for public benefits, is anonymity in the food system a good thing? No. I mean, why did we have the horse meat scandal in Europe a few years ago? Anonymity in the food system. I could claim this is beef when it's really horse meat. So transparency in the food system will, I believe, cause people to self-govern their behaviors because things are a little bit more in public view. And so I think traceability is a big, big idea, and I think it's a game changer. And I'm just talking about the food safety benefits, Bob. You know that on top of the food safety benefits, there are a ton of other benefits, such as reducing shrink, sustainability, et cetera. No, I'm so glad you expanded beyond food recall because prevention, inspections, and then going back up to healthy eating habits, obesity trends, consumers wanting to learn more about what they put on their bodies, all that is predicated on the transparency that I think you, I just, you just talked about. So I'd like to shift gears a bit more and maybe you could just unpack a bit what's in the food traceability rule, first and foremost, just for our listeners who may not be familiar with the rule. And secondary, and this is probably two questions phrased as one, Frank, I apologize. Talk about what industry should be doing to get ready, which is a big lift for many companies. Let's start with the food traceability rule itself. You know, I'm very proud of what the team at FDA did in developing this rule. It was a challenge to develop the rule, but I would ask your listeners to take a deep dive if you're going to have to comply with the rule, understand what's in it. But there are a couple of key central concepts that I think are important is number one, it identifies the type of foods that are going to have to comply with what we call this additional record keeping. When Congress gave FDA the mandate to write this rule, they said, don't require it for all types of foods, but require it for those types of foods that have been implicated in foodborne outbreaks. And they gave us a list of criteria of, you know, the cost to society, how often are they involved with outbreaks? Is there a processing intervention that reduces or minimizes the risk? And so there's a set of criteria that are published on the website. But number one, become familiar with what's on the food traceability list. We call it the food traceability list. We do not call it high-risk foods because any food could potentially be high-risk. But become familiar with the foods. It's a significant and long list of foods, but they're the types of foods that you might expect, you know, fresh leafy greens, fresh cut produce, fish type products, and a host of others. Become familiar with that. And then I think what the team at FDA got right is, Bob, they wrote the rule, what I describe with 21st century lenses. One of the things I've been doing is following food traceability legislation around the world. And if you think about what happened here in the U.S., you know, up until now, we were largely dependent on the Biotins and Preparedness Act that said one step up and one step back traceability. I'll be really candid with you. That's always left me very unfulfilled because it doesn't tell you what you have to trace. And if you sit in our shoes where you're involved in an outbreak and everybody's doing one step forward and one step backward different ways, it gets really, really hard to go through reams of paper to try to figure out if these dots connect. So they wrote a rule understanding that data standards would be critical. And the rule identifies two critical concepts that emerged when FDA did some initial traceability pilots, but they're these terms that we call key data elements. What are the types of data elements that have to be kept at different nodes in the food system and critical tracking events? What are the types of events that would require it? Obviously, if you're shipping or receiving food, if you're transforming the food. So those are two critical concepts that your listeners should become familiar with. We also introduced a concept that's pretty important there. They're called the food traceability lock code, which one of the things we saw over time, Bob, and I think you know, is different nodes in the food system all love to put their own form of lot 
on these products. And you had, you know, a series of five or six different lots to the continuum of the life cycle of the product, even if the product wasn't transformed. And it was like, why do you need so many different identifiers for that? So those are the critical concepts. But what I see or I recommend that your listeners do that have to comply and what I see the good companies already doing is number one is they're getting started right now. You've already heard me say that January 2026 is right around the corner. It's May 23. Trust me, January 26 will be here before you know it. It'll be the blink of the eye. So don't wait and don't think, oh, we got a couple of years to be thinking about this. Another thing that I see companies doing very well, Bob, is already assembling their food traceability task force. So they're getting people in the organization to say, let's figure out what we have to do. And I stress that because you can't delegate this to the food safety team. In fact, there's other people in the organization that'll probably have more influence or more insights on what needs to be done than your food safety staff. So they have folks from logistics or replenishment, supply chain, et cetera. But usually they've assembled a team of cross-functional partners in the organization to take a look at it. They're reviewing the rule. That's number three. I love this quote. I've used it a lot over the course of my career, which is a problem well-defined is half solved. What is that we have to do? Really understand it. And I'm seeing people starting to say, well, you know, the rule isn't as difficult as we thought. We already have processes in place. We already capture some of this data in systems. It's just how do we extract it? I would say review the rule. And I would say and review other sources of information, Bob. First thing is go to the FDA website, but not because I'm talking to you, because I'm out there always scouring the literature and what's out there on food traceability. You guys have done an amazing job. Some of the resources you have now, right now on the GS1 website. So go to the GS1 website, see their food traceability document on how to comply with section 204 of FISMA, and then collaborate. What I've already seen and heard talking to some large chains is they're collaborating with others. This isn't a competitive issue. And so start talking to them, how are they solving it and learning. And again, you might think, hey, I should give Frank a GS1 vest, but GS1 already has a group, a working group. So get together with them and start sharing. Because some of the pain points I will tell you, and we'll talk a little bit about them. I think people are going to figure out how to comply in user-friendly ways. And it may be that your organization might learn from another organization that's participating in these. Leverage the suite of GS1 solutions. And then here's the last one I have, Bob, that I haven't advocated too strongly on so far. But as I talk to companies, this one's becoming more important, is conduct what I call a mock trace back and trace forward exercise. Companies do mock recalls. But I want you to do the mock trace back and trace forward exercise from the perspective of, does it comply with the requirements of the food traceability rule? And so you could do one right now and you'll identify where your gaps pretty quickly. And so those are some of the things I recommend and some of the best practices that I'm seeing emerge. I absolutely love your statement, which I've written down, a problem well-defined is half solved. I may uh, shamelessly steal that from you, Frank. And you had another expression last week when we were together around collaboration means data sharing and sharing data. You know, the collaboration of five or 10 years ago might have been getting around a table and discussing now real collaboration is dictated by how able are we to share data? Otherwise, it's really tough to collaborate in a digital world. I want to go back to this topic of food safety inspections and the modernization and the gaps we currently face in our inspection system, because that really is at the heart, I believe, of food safety prevention which is what we're all interested in. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about the current tracking and inspection process and how this role helps to evolve that quite a bit. That's excellent. It's one of the ideas that I'm most excited about is what we often refer to at FDA inspection modernization. You know, I think it's applicable to the private sector as well. It's not only for public regulatory agencies. The private sector does a host and even more inspections than the public sector, right? They require third-party audits or they audit themselves. So I would just probably term it more broadly compliance modernization, but it's really exciting times. And Bob, let me just start off with this premise. You know, if you think about how we're doing compliance oversight today, it's still using the 20th century paradigm. And I'm so excited that we can converge and move to our 21st century paradigm. And this is what I mean. It's a 20th century paradigm of compliance oversight or inspection We're really in the food safety field, but you can think of any discipline that you're in if you're listening and you're not in the food space. You generally are identifying and trying to ensure the safety or compliance of two assets, 
One is the facilities that make those assets. In my case, I'm very interested in food production facilities, whether they're retail establishments, food manufacturers, processors, distributors, or farms. And then the foods, which are also asset, right? Food assets. What kind of products do they make and what's the safety of these goods? In the 20th century model, what we did is we would then write rules of how these facilities, assets should operate. We had good manufacturing practices, some of the FISMA-based rules, HACCP plans. And then the way we determine whether we're in compliance or not is, at least for the federal government, FDA, we would go and inspect those facilities once every three or five years. If you're defined as a high-risk facility by FDA, you get inspected once every three years. If you're a non-high-risk, you get inspected once every five years. Now, for the foods, same thing. We might write standards of identity. These are the parameters that products have to meet for them to be able to be called, let's say, for example, Greek yogurt. One of my favorites. If you're in the private sector, write specifications. You know, for safety reasons, it's got to be salmonella free, listeria free by 25 grams or the number of samples that you need. And for the food assets, the same thing, Bob, is well, we might randomly pool samples and test. And regulatory agencies, just they don't have the wherewithal when you think about the bandwidth of the food system, rarely can pull products and test, but they do, and the states do a little. What I mean about changing the compliance paradigm, and I think you're nodding because you get this completely because of the world that you live in. We now increasingly have the ability to give physical assets, digital identities, leveraging things such as the GS1 suite of offerings, and with some of the technologies we talked about, digital voices. So think about this. We're basically making the physical digital. And once we create digital identities and digital voices, whether it's some of the sensor technologies that we talked about, IoT, which I'm seeing increasingly, there's no need to ever go into a facility to identify refrigeration temperatures because you can monitor all that remotely. New sensor technology that you can place on products to go beyond tracking and tracing, but track, trace, and monitor. And then you're capturing more information than, let's say, what we've historically captured. You can capture a lot more information than what you currently have in your compliance oversight systems. You can capture weather conditions. You can capture all sorts of things. And you could do a better job with what I call risk prioritization. Not only can you do a better job because you have more insights, but you can make that more dynamic. It can be continual risk prioritization, right? So you can move from a world where rather than inspecting a facility once every three years or once every five years, you inspect the facility when it needs to be inspected. And then in this new digital world, uh, one of the things we were working on, Bob, is the idea that you can have different types of compliance oversight tools. I think the gold standard will always be, hey, for the time being here in the short term, is we'll send somebody into the facility. But you can leverage remote assessments, remote audits. You can go into and digitally monitor whether a pasteurizer is meeting temperatures. And so you can have a suite of tools for compliance oversight. And the simple examples that I like to use is changing the oil in my car. I know for longer I have to do that once every three months or four months. I do that when my automobile tells me it's time to change the oil because of these types of approaches. Or referring to the cast member of me, because I worked at Disney, is we literally are moving from what I would call a snapshot that's taken once every three or five years in black and white to real-time monitoring the equivalent of real-time streaming. And it's not that foreign, Bob, we're not talking about blue sky. All of this is within reach. You think about how we're listening to music differently, right? We all listen to music, but unless you really are in favor of it, you're probably not putting vinyl on a turntable. We all need directions. The Lord knows I do when I'm traveling, but I no longer pull out a map and we all still have to talk, right? But we're not talking on the landline. So it's the same idea. There's going to be this paradigm shift in inspection modernization. The tools are already emerging. They're there. We just have to step up and do it. The agency is very committed to doing this. I actually think, Bob, the private sector should lead the way and reinvent how they're doing compliance oversight and share some of these practices with regulators around the world. You know, what I love about this conversation, Frank, is we're starting to create a future where people are motivated out of commitment and the benefit, the carrot, and not out of compliance and cost and the stick. And I think people are starting to see how the technology gives them an opportunity to run their business more effectively, to meet their shopper, or in the case of healthcare, the patient where they are, and to anticipate those issues before they become a hugely costly recall or heaven forbid, a patient error in a healthcare environment. I think that's really exciting. I want to uh, talk a little bit about the conversation you had last week with our board of governors. We're very fortunate to have a pretty impressive cross-section of industry leadership from food service, from retail grocery, from the apparel space, 
many of the leading marketplace platforms are represented. We had some very candid conversation and I was asking or, or hoping maybe you could share just some observations from that conversation and what you took away from where the industry is and some of the questions that we shared with you last week. Well, Bob, thank you for facilitating that larger conversation on food traceability and allowing me to join. I was really encouraged by the conversation. I would say my first takeaway was that the conversation is changing. You know, it was less about, are we going to do this? Do we have to do this? It was really about, we're prepared and this is what we're doing about it. So the conversation has matured. We're at a very different point in this traceability continuum. There were concerns expressed and, you know, I'll be transparent as you always are with your listeners, which is, I think some of the concerns we heard was number one is the cost. We heard this is going to be costly. I just want to make sure that the listeners know that when you put out a rule in federal service, you have to do a cost benefit analysis. And FDA has some great food economists. And we did very thorough cost benefit analysis of this additional record keeping for the types of foods and the number of suppliers that exist across the U.S. and elsewhere. And it was a favorable cost benefit analysis just on food safety alone. You've heard me talk about these sweeping recalls, illnesses that can be averted. Just on the food safety benefits alone, there's a return on investment. And while we didn't, if you overlay the other benefits that you might be able to gain through more efficient supply chains, benefits to sustainability, I have no doubt that on balance, and when this is all said and done, it'll take cost out of the food system. I, I always like to say, while there was a cost-benefit analysis in terms of our federal review when I was working at the world's largest retailer, it was a discount retailer. We weren't interested in doing things that added cost to the food system. We thought that greater transparency we would remove costs from the food system. The other thing I heard, Bob, was this issue of time, January 26th, and is that going to be enough time to get this done? Rightfully so. Some people are aware that FDA has been working on the Drug Supply Chain Security Act for over a decade. You know, it's been a long time and they've made progress on it. And people will say, Frank, well, the food system is a larger system. It's more distributed and decentralized. That seems to be in a very aggressive timeline. We're at a different place. And so I think, yeah, is it a stretch goal? Yes, but I do. I think it's achievable. And so that's the goal that we have in front of us. So like I said, get started now. The third thing I heard from your board was identifying, you know, what are the foods that are on the food traceability list? And it's a little bit complicated. And I think in time, that'll become a little bit easier as people start studying and do a review. There were questions about, well, what if I have a food on the food traceability list, but it ends up being an ingredient in another food product? Will they be required to continue to track traceability and what's my role versus their role in it. And so the answer is, if you have a product that's on the food traceability list and it ends up an ingredient in another food product, if there isn't an inactivation step that removes or reduces the risk of that ingredient, yeah, then that food product will have to be tracked, if you will, per the rule. But each node in the food system is responsible for their records. And so you're not responsible for keeping a manufacturer that's using one of your ingredients records from their node on forward. So that was fair. And I, GS1 is stepping up to try to make it a little bit easier to understand which products are on the food traceability list. And Bob, I'll let you share a little bit more of that if you want. The last one is this one. And this first is probably the biggest one, to be very candid. The way we wrote the rule was we wrote the rule in a manner that while nobody is required to have complete provenance, everyone in the food continuum has to do their part. So you can't have complete provenance without any one party being responsible. And what I mean by that. In a lot of the outbreaks that I've worked on over the years, Bob, there's a lot of finger pointing. The retailers would point the finger and say, if the darn farmers just did their part, we'd be able to trace it back to the farm. And the farmers will tell me, well, Frank, if the retailers or food service companies tracked, then this wouldn't be a problem. Let me tell you, I, I don't want to point fingers and I don't want to choose sides, but I can tell you one of the biggest missing links in food traceability and outbreak investigations is that last mile. We detect the cluster of illnesses. We know they've shopped at a particular retailer. We know they've eaten at a particular restaurant. But the records are just not there. Because up until today, retailers and food service chains are not capturing accurate traceability on what arrives at the store. And the best we have generally is decent traceability to the DC. And you have to guesstimate which lots or used by dates might have gone to a store or restaurant. And it's never an exact science. And so when we wrote the rule, Bob, to make the long story short is that we said you have to have traceability to point of service, not point of sale. You don't have to capture it at the register, but you have to be able to say if you're a restaurant or a retailer, these are the products on the food traceability that I received. 
the lots and the dates. And so rightfully so, this is a big change for retailers and food service companies, and there's a lot of angst and concern about it. So that's the biggest conversation. But, you know, I also think there's a great opportunity there, Bob, in that I see the innovation already happening. How do we capture that information in a low labor model? How do we automate that capture of that information? They're going to figure it out. Some companies are already doing it. As you know, some brands have already come out and announced initiatives that they're doing where they're capturing traceability at the store level. And I think in time, and GS1 has done a pretty good job of this with the cost benefit analysis and case studies that you've published. I think at time people are going to say, well, wow, there's all kinds of benefits that I derive on this. I'm just not complying with section 204, but listen, now I'm moving from a first in, first out to first expired, first out. I'm putting the freshest patties possible on the grill. So that's what I heard from the GS1 board of directors. They always have insightful questions. And more excitedly, I'm looking forward to maybe hearing from you in a year from now and figuring out how they've solved some of these challenges. I think you summarized it so well, Frank. I share your views around it's moving the conversation out of the if we need to do this and we want to potentially invoke legal action to how do we get this done? And how do we talk about the cost and the benefit? I was so impressed when we had that cost benefit analysis with the candor that you shared with the board. And also within an hour, you had the cost benefit in my inbox from the FDA that I shared with our board. And we've gotten some initial great responses from that. So there's no secret for this. There's no trying to be protective. Like the food system, we want to be transparent. And the other topic I would just build on that you mentioned is the notion of a gift with purchase, that when we do these things around traceability, it yields dividends in areas of sustainability, in areas of inventory management. And back to the conversation about RFID and monitoring thing once a year, we used to take inventory in a retail establishment 10 or 15 years, maybe twice a year. Now with RFID, you can continuously do that. Well, guess what? There's a level of prevention. I can start to anticipate what you want. And I can certainly promise you that shirt that you want to wear this Friday night when you stop in that Walmart store on Friday afternoon. And that's powerful. It's really, really powerful. So I'd like to go to a next question, which is something that you've talked so much about, which is none of us can do this on our own. And you mentioned that each of us has to fulfill our responsibility as a node, if you will, in a very long supply chain or value chain. What resources do you think the industry needs to help them prepare for this new rule? How can we as GS1 US, some of the other associations for which you've been very kind to introduce GS1 and, and allow us to partner, how can we better work together? That's great because I do believe this unique experience I've had, and uh, I'm very humbled and consider myself fortunate, but this balcony level view of this distributed and decentralized food system, I know you've been an advocate of how do you create shared value? And the only way the food system gets better is when we work together, right? No single entity can make it better alone. And when there's benefits or shared value, I'm going to participate because I'm going to derive some value. It's not just because the big bad retailer or the federal government is making me do it. And any work we undertake, we got to realize it's part of a system. And that in a system, you tend to win and lose together, right? So uh, if you have an outbreak in a system, all spinach farmers lose. So, you know, shared best practices. And so this concept of shared value is really important. Two simple words, but I would really spend some time thinking about it. I think also we have to find these best practices. Right now, Bob, as I told you, I'm scouring the literature. And I would say the resources right now that are available are going to the FDA website, They've done a better job than usual on guidance and direction on how to comply with the rule. So take a look at the materials they published. But I would tell you, if I was back in the private sector and the company that I was working for had to comply, I'd spend a lot of time on the GS1 website. Your document, I haven't memorized the document, but it's a guide on how to comply with FISMA 204. It's really, really good. I've read it several times. I haven't emailed you because I don't have any major corrections and saying, Bob, you need to change this, but it's a great footprint. When I was at FDA, your listeners may not know this, it's worth detouring here. The very first invitation I extended to an organization or a guest speaker outside of FDA to come in and talk to me and the food safety team was GS1. Again, not the flatter Bob or GS1 was just because I saw in my own career that as we were trying to do our work, our lack of knowledge of this wonderful process that's going on through consensus standards to identify these assets that we're trying to regulate was profound. And it just changed the way I thought about how I did my work. So resources go to the GS1 website. Those are the two, FDA website and GS1 website. 
and do a deep dive on food traceability. But then I think working together, and I don't think the public and private sector are working closer together. And if it's one of the biggest lessons I have after almost 60 years on the planet, 30 plus years in the profession was, wow, when the public and private sector work together, the stuff we can do. You think about the pandemic and Operation Warp Speed. Could have never happened. The private sector trying to do it alone or the government trying to do it alone. And I've seen this time after time. So with the big challenges in society, let's work together. And so look for opportunities for greater public-private collaboration would be a take-home message. And those are just some of the ideas that come top of mind. Well, first of all, let me thank you for the acknowledgement on the guideline. But let me also acknowledge the work of over 55 companies with whom we worked for the last 18 months to do that. So that's a wonderful illustration of what's possible when you can collaborate and harness the collective power and insight of all those organizations to produce a document like that. But we still have more work to do. There's a lot more education and training that we're offering to industry. And with regard to the public-private partnership, you know this is a passion of mine. And we can cite so many examples. We oftentimes go back to DARPA and the work that they did 60 plus years ago to really father the internet, if you will. And that's just so exciting. So we believe there's more to come in the areas that we can do there. Frank, this has been a great discussion. Uh, Before we close out, just anything else you'd like to add regarding FISMA? Anything perhaps I didn't touch on that you'd like to share with our listeners? Bob, I'll just elaborate a little bit more on the point we just made and one you made earlier, which is collaboration. You know, we're talking about public-private, but I think it's worth just trying to share with the listeners this idea of collaboration in 21st century, because it's really important. Some people are already there and they're leading the pack, but we all need to get along with this. And it's this idea that we have to think differently. The 20th century was the industrial age. The 21st century is the data age. That's what it's going to go down, you know, the digital revolution. And we see how this is sweeping all sectors and forms of operations and businesses and governments in the world around us. And one of the things we need to try to accelerate and put the foot on the pedal a little bit harder on is what does private, public, private, private, public, public collaboration mean in the 21st century? And you said it, and I agree 100%. It's not about getting around a table anymore, getting on a Zoom call and sharing best practices. Listen, I've been on enough boards for large organizations to say, yeah, in the 80s, that felt right. (laughs) But today it it always leaves me unsatisfied. And it is data sharing. Data is the new currency. And whatever you're trying to improve, for me, it's food safety. Better food safety begins and ends with better data. Bottom line. And so let's figure out how do we do data sharing? Like I said, public to public, private to private, private to public. And so I'm really encouraging people. Listen, we're going to have to start small. It's going to make us a little uncomfortable. This is more about behavioral science than the technology itself. But let's figure out, let's create some safe mechanisms to do data sharing. I can tell you the federal government has a host of issues and challenges in front of it. And if the private sector is willing to step up and say, listen, we have more data and insights than you do, and collectively as an industry, we know our data has the solutions, let's work together to figure out how to get there. And so um, I would just encourage your listeners to be open, do some proof of concepts, get involved. It's so interesting to hear how the data and how the data is shared needs to really fundamentally cause us to rethink collaboration. We're seeing this in some of the work we do historically with very well-defined industry verticals like food service or retail grocery or power general merchandise. The problem is now most retail establishments sell all those things and they have a pharmacy as well. So you're seeing this horizontal cut and the data sharing is really, I think, driving that a bit as well. So we just need to fundamentally think about how we work differently together. And and most of this data, all this data in our view is really pre-competitive. This is another thing that we reference. Basic master data about what an item is really isn't a source of competitive advantage. So let's work together, speak the same language and create some scale for everyone. Frank, I wanted to close by, you've just come off I believe, was it four years at FDA? Do I have the number right? Yeah. Four and a half intense years of service to our country. So first of all, thank you so much for doing that. But what's next? What's next for you? You've got some well-deserved time with your family, I understand. I know you're uh, doing some consulting arrangements, one with GS1 US, and we're very, very privileged and excited to have you support us. But what's next for you? 
First of all, let me just say what an honor and privilege again to serve the American people on regulated industries. It really was the highlight of my career, and I'm so grateful, and the many other organizations that I work for. So you're right. I'm not taking too much time off. My wife reminds me of that. I'm engaging in, you know, anything. I'm totally committed to creating a better world, one that leads to a safer, smarter. These words are intentional. Safety smarter. That means we have to digitalize and do some of the things that Bob and I just talked about, a more sustainable food system that will benefit this generation, but future generations. So I'm being very intentional as what I call a freelancer on what I engage with. And so big ideas, such as the conversation we've had here today to advance the food system. It's more important than ever. And there aren't too many topics, Bob, in my view, that are more important than food. Continuing and probably trying to do a little bit more teaching or writing. I am an adjunct professor at Michigan State University. I've written two books previously. Uh, I have two already underway. They're moving along slowly, but I love writing. So you'll see a little bit more about that. And then, you know, I like to end all of these questions of this manner in the same fashion, which is never say never. I think that's probably good advice for anyone is never say never. So I won't rule out. I don't want to start any rumors, but I won't rule out that I could be back in federal service one day. Or I could be back working for a big brand one day. But most importantly is, you know, no matter what role you're in, whether you're in the public or private sector, whether you're in a big organization or small, what I've seen firsthand and personal, Bob, is that everybody can contribute and make a difference. And so I sign off on most of my social media posts these days with a hashtag called unfinished business. I think it's appropriate. And I can't think about a better way to end our conversation than our commitment with you to a, a safer, smarter, and more sustainable food system. So thanks again, Frank, for joining us. And we'll see you soon. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US. If you enjoyed today's show, you can subscribe to our feed or explore more great episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to share and follow us on social media. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.